Oh, you're rolling? Yeah. Okay. Well, Peter, welcome to Texas. It's nice Thank to you. have you here. I must tell you straight away that uh, I know your country. I've toured your country. Oh, wow. Okay. North Island, South ah. Island. Yes. When? How long uh, ago? About 15 years ago. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And loved it. Right. What a beautiful, majestic country uh, you have. Thank you. And the people are great. Mm. And uh, I didn't get to uh, know very much about your film industry at that time. And then the other thing, Peter, that we have in common is that we're both Monty Python fans. Ah, <laughs> right, okay, good. <laughs> so, <we're, laughs> you know, I think we're on mm. similar wavelengths here. Um, yeah, the Pythons are just, uh, yeah. you know, long time, long, long time mm. uh, favorites of mine. But anyway, we're here to talk about your picture, Heavenly Creatures. And uh, I must tell you, I think it's a very fine motion picture. Thank you. I enjoyed it very much. Um, I, I think that people who see it, um, maybe when they walk into the theater, they won't realize that this is an actual case history. Mm, mm. And then as the picture begins to unfold, they realize mm. that it is. Mm. What is the feeling of the people of New Zealand now about this motion picture being made of this famous murder case? Well, I think that people are intrigued to see it. I, I, the film actually started screening in New Zealand on the day that I flew to come over here, so I haven't sort of had the benefit of having my ear to the ground and hearing what the reaction is. But um, I think people were a little stunned when they knew that I was making the film because in New Zealand I've got a reputation for previous movies which I've made, which have all been like horror, splatter, gore films, sort of comedies, but fairly over-the-top comedies. So they were curious as to what I was going to do with the story, which is a story that everybody in New Zealand has heard of. It's a bit like, like the Leopold Loeb case here. It's sort of one of those cases that's part of your nation's sort of notorious history. Um, and the case is, uh, is, is sort of misunderstood. It's been misunderstood for the 40 years since it happened. Um, it's always been known for its like sensational sort of lesbian schoolgirl killer type of headlines that, um, because in 1954 when this murder happened, nobody had a rational explanation for it. I mean, you know, criminal psychology was fairly primitive in New Zealand at that time. So they figured that if there's no explanation, therefore the girls must be evil. There's no rational, you know, other rational explanation. So they branded them as some sort of criminal psychopaths and that stigma has really lasted and sort of become part of mythology. And when Fran Walsh and I decided to, to you know, to write a script on based on this case, which no one has really seriously re-evaluated over the past 40 years. We really wanted to take it back to the human beings and to say, well, they weren't evil. I mean, they were two 15-year-old girls. I mean, you know, they did this extraordinarily tragic thing, but there had to have been some forces at work within their friendship or outside of their friendship that led them to, to this action, and we set out to try and discover what they were and present them in the movie. If that case were being tried now in New Zealand, do you think it would have the same outcome? Um, yeah, I think it would. You know, I mean, they were fairly obviously guilty of, of killing this woman, a and so there was nothing they could do about that. I, I mean, it's interesting. I don't think necessarily that, that, that the murder would have happened if, it was, if the events took place today because I think there's a lot more tolerance. Um, at the you know at the time this friendship was seen as being unhealthy and there was a concerted attempt to split the two girls up but i think in this day and age you know no everyone would think well it's great they're friends and it's wonderful and you know they wouldn't be judged so harshly what is the uh, status of the girls now where are they what are they doing well two uh, um we've never really wanted to focus on on wh where they are now because we always hoped that their privacy would be you know, maintained. Um, they've not wished to have anything to do with any journalists or anyone kind of investigating the case for the last 40 years. They had their names changed by the government when they were released from prison in 1959. But just recently, um, uh, one of them, Juliet Hume, has been giving some interviews and she is now a, a crime novelist, a murder novelist living in Scotland by the name of Anne Perry. Um, and Pauline is still um, hasn't been discovered and I mean we've obviously heard various rumours about where she is and what she's doing but I, you know without her having gone public I, I, I don't really want to just to say what we know about her. In the uh, titles following the film it says that part of their 
parole and, and they're getting out of prison, the conditions were that they never see one another again. Mm. That was um, a statement that the judge made at the sentencing. They were sentenced to be detained at Her Majesty's pleasure, which effectively means life without parole, although the government at its discretion could decide to release you at any time. But basically, you know, you're put away for as long as the authorities deem necessary. Um, and in his sentencing, the judge said that uh, should the, you know, the government ever decide that these two girls were to be released, they must make absolutely sure that they never had any contact with each other. Because it was seen that neither Pauline or Juliet was a criminal, that they were not going to ever offend again, and that this occurred just because of the, of the two of them actually bonding so, so closely. So it was felt by splitting them up and by ensuring that they stay apart, then sort of the people of New Zealand would be safe. <laughs> But I don't know how you would ever enforce something No, like I that. mean, of course. I mean, for all we know, they could be have, having dinner tonight. No, I mean, obviously, 40 years later, it's impossible to enforce it. They, they made the attempt to enforce it at the time they were released. They released Juliet Hume first and flew her out of New Zealand immediately to England, where she rejoined her family. And Pauline was um, kept in prison for another two weeks until Juliet was like safely out of the way. And then Pauline was released, but she was kept on parole in New Zealand. So she was actually unable to leave the country for many more years, right into the 60s. Do you think that uh, even when it happened in the 50s, that they could, their lawyers could have uh, said that they were um, mentally unbalanced or mentally unstable or psychologically unstable? Um, the defense attempted to, uh, to get a, a verdict of insanity. Um, they tried to, uh, to plead a defense which is called um, folie deux, which is a French meaning the madness of two, which was only the second time in history that that defense had ever been used, the first time being in the Leopold Loeb case with Clarence Darrow. Um, who he didn't win at that time, and the Parker Hume lawyers didn't win their one either. I don't think that's ever worked. Um, but it was honestly a good thing that they weren't judged to be insane, because in New Zealand at that time, um, the mentally insane used to be taken away to some fairly nasty um, mental hospitals, and often they were they were actually chopped and sort of um, and and their their you know frontal lobes were. Uh, were, were oper operated on to try and calm them down and that was actually happening in the 50s and that you know may well have happened to Pauline and Juliet if they'd actually won their insanity plea so in hindsight um, spending five years in jail and being released you know at the age of 20 was was in effect a fair and reasonable sentence I think. One of the fascinating parts of the film Peter is uh, the fourth world when the girls mm. enter into this mm. uh, extra dimension mm. and um, I think you bring that across cinematically. That comes mm. across very, very nicely. Well, I, well, I was, um, you know, setting out to, to tell the story. I, the one thing that I was very adamant about at the beginning is I didn't want to make a murder movie. I didn't want to make a film about a murder and kind of have it grim and depressing, like, you know, some there's a genre of British films like Dance with a Stranger, Let Him Have It, which are about their sort of famous murder cases in the 50s, and they're all I find them so grim and sort of you think, oh, it's like an ordeal to sit there and watch it. And, uh, you know, we saw this film as very much being a story of a friendship between two um, young women who had never had a friend before, who had this, these extraordinary um, flights of imagination. They wrote books. They wanted to go to Hollywood. They, they wanted their, like, medieval um, fantasy books to be adapted in the films, and they wanted to star in them alongside Mario Lanza and James Mason. And Mario Lanza's music features in the film as it did in their lives. And so there's a whole lot of life and energy in the film that we really wanted to, to bring across. And slowly, of course, the events, you know, turn towards the, the tension and suspense as they hatch this plan. But, you know, again, I mean, nothing that they did was actually extraordinary. I mean, I'm sure people all the time fantasize about killing somebody. And what is extraordinary in this case is they went that giant step from fantasy to making it actually a, a reality, which is really the extraordinary part of the story. Well, Peter, I thank you very much for coming by today and sharing your thoughts with us about the film. And uh, again, I'll tell you that uh, I think it's a fascinating picture and it's thank very you. well done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is it a two-shot here? Yes, and then, Bob, I'm going to have you, uh, we'll pull back and if you'll just... Okay. Um, just, just be looking at the second Yeah, time, okay. Um, uh, no, I thought the uh, in in her diaries mm. uh, were these uh, creatures uh, explained in the detail that 
the best people to put inside these rubber costumes were, were 16 and 17 year old girls because apparently they have more stamina and endurance than any other people like, like more than what boys have got um, and so we sort of set about finding all these young women to fit inside these rubber costumes so it was good though it all, it all worked out well we had to um, well, I mean, once the heads were on, they were all set, they were sealed up, so they could hardly breathe, and we had to have some compressed air hoses and be able to put them down the neck and sort of blast fresh air into the suit um, every now and again. What was your budget on the picture? Less than seven million dollars. It was um, quite low, but it was like you know double what a New Z normal New Zealand film would be. It oh. was it was a big budget for by New Zealand standards. It let us do everything we wanted to do. Mm. All right. So, you okay? Yes, ma'am. All right. Correct.